you know, we'll start the seminar in one minute. We'll give a minute for people to trickle in. We have a fair number of people, and since some people are chatting with me, um, I've been trying this thing of trying to get people to start chatting by asking a question. So <laughs> here's my pre-talk warm-up. Um, does anyone know who both these people are? I think most of you may know one, but so a lot of this talk will be inspired by in a sense, both of these people in, in an intellectual sense. So I'm intrigued to see how many of you actually, as applied probabilists, know who both of these are. So yeah, just send me a direct message. If you are do. you offering a prize? <laughs> um, uh, I didn't think of this. Uh, not yet, okay. Daniel has got one person. So I think most of you may know the person on the right. Oh, wow, yeah. So Marco actually did get both. So one reason I put this up is, and I think as like we often go to these talks and we sort of talk about the most recent work, but we kind of forget like the, the giants whose shoulders we're sort of standing on. And in for this talk in particular, for me at least, in a lot of my research, these two are very central to everything I do. They're also perhaps two of the, most heroic people in probability in a certain sense, in applied probability. And so if you do get really bored halfway through my talk and don't want to listen to me, but if I get you to go on Wikipedia and check up on both of these people, um, I think that would be really worth it. Only one person up till now has identified both. So bragging rights, how's that for a prize? <laughs> okay, let's let's get started. Um, I, think, I think everyone's here, so. Um, welcome to the SNAP seminar. Um, we're well, uh, excited to, well, this is the second talk of the semester and i um, looking forward to a really great lineup this, this semester. A couple logistics about the seminar. Um, you, uh, the, the seminar talk is being recorded. So um, uh, yeah, if you don't want to appear on the video, just mute yourself um, or you can watch on YouTube. Um, and um we if you have any questions you are welcome to type your questions into the chat box um and sid will pause in the middle of the talk uh, at a good time to take questions and there will also be a q a session at the end of the talk um and uh so please keep your well please mute yourself but feel free to keep your video on and um i posted the link in the chat box for the uh slides so today we are really excited to have Sid Banerjee um, present on his work. And he is a assistant professor in operations research and information engineering at Cornell, as well as a field member in CSEC and Center for Applied Mathematics. And his research is on stochastic modeling control and the design of algorithms and incentives for large systems. Um, and he has he got his PhD from UT Austin, worked as a postdoc at Stanford. As, as, and has also consulted at Lyft. And um, he's also, his work is supported by NSF and also R ARL. And um, we're really excited to hear about how, how we should talk about online decision-making. <laughs> Sid, over to you. Thanks, Christina. Um, questions still online. So as I was saying, if anyone just came in, I, I like sort of asking a bunch of questions just to get people involved and chatting. So. As of now, only one person has identified both these people. They will both appear halfway through the talk. So hopefully that's some reason to stay on. Um, okay, so that's one puzzle. Here's another one. And this is much more related to the talk. So some of you have seen this. If you have, please don't jump on and answer this. Um, but uh, this is a puzzle which in some sense got me started about this whole line of work and so the the problem is the following. So this is something called the unit demand knapsack. The idea is it's a very sort of classical online decision-making problem. So you have B items, so it's your knapsack size. Um, you have T buyers who are arriving sequentially and each buyer is offering some reward, some reward V of T. Um, you don't know the reward beforehand, but when the buyer comes, they tell you, like, this is how much we are willing to pay for the item. Um, and you have to make an irrevocable decision. You have to sort of decide it's, it's a take it or leave it decision and you can't replenish your resource. So you just have fixed B resources, they keep disappearing. Um, and your aim is to somehow maximize your total earnings. Now, at this point, this is not a puzzle because most of you would have realized I've not said anything about these rewards. So 
what the hell are these rewards without knowing them how can you do anything um so here's the puzzle so suppose i tell you one extra piece of information which is that every buyer is of offering only one of two values they'll either give you 50 dollars or they'll give you 100 dollars and christina has somehow figured out all of the v of t's beforehand she works a lot in machine learning she just knows this stuff um i don't and the question i'm asking is well how well can i do in terms of revenue compared to christina so christina knows exactly what each buyer is offering all i know is that each buyer is offering either 50 dollars or 100 dollars or choose your favorite currency um this is one of those points where i'm happy if anyone wants to put up their hand and say how well you think i can do i'm happy to pause for suggestions well okay uncomfortable silence i have learned from teaching over zoom that i have to just wait hopefully you haven't told us what you know do you know the distribution or like nothing no i i just give you this piece of information that the values are either 50 or 100 i can do as Daniel well as you know the answer but he's cheating okay yeah mm-hmm. sure as well as you know can't i so i'll yeah. just wait for hundreds and uh, uh, uh up to the first um uh, I don't know when this game is going to end until the last T slots I'll only accept the 100 guys and then in the last exactly T slots like I know there are only T people coming in but keep going oh, oh sorry sorry the T people coming in sorry so and I have B items so I'll only keep accepting the 100 guys and then once I know that the number of remaining people is same as my number of empty slots then I'll just accept everybody Okay, I see a lot of people nodding. Did you guys get that? So what Siva did is he got a solution which does exactly as well as Christina without knowing any information. And the suggestion was, well, keep accepting the hundreds. Clearly, that's the highest you can get. Why not? Uh, at some point, you will realize that your budget is equal to the number of people who are still going to come. Now, just accept everyone. Okay. so why do we need to take, uh, talk about how we talk about online decision making um it's kind of weird that we have a bunch of people who are all sort of experts in this problem and this wasn't immediately obvious and and i don't mean to kind of sound demeaning like when i first thought of this it wasn't at all obvious to me i i was kind of surprised that this is true um and that that sort of got me started on thinking about just how am i thinking about these problems um, because like i was thinking exactly about this problem or of a version that i'll show you very soon um and how exactly should we be thinking about this such that this was well, somewhat obvious so hopefully i can try and tell you how maybe silver was thinking about it but like definitely how i was how i have been thinking about these problems now yash is pointing out that the binary support is crucial in that example and that is true and i'll i'll come back to that in a second um but nevertheless like this like what was this is kind of this meta question where i'm trying to think of okay what were the barriers in the way we think about this problem which didn't let us see this obvious solution um and i claim that there are a bunch of problems about how we typically think about online decision making which kind of puts these barriers in the way we want to think about this problem um so i'll give you some high level thoughts hope hopefully somewhat controversial but not too controversial about what's wrong in the way we talk about online decision making and and some plots to convince you that i'm not just making the stuff up there is a better way of doing it um and then i'll kind of get to the main part of my talk which is thinking about benchmarks and and a certain sample path coupling method which i feel is a much more cleaner and more intuitive way of thinking about many of these problems so that's the plan for the rest of the talk and um this talk is based on a bunch of papers which i've written with several collaborators uh, i saw daniel is online so daniel friend who's now at mit alberto who was uh, my phd student who's now at amazon and who really did a bulk of the initial work and a lot of the sort of uh, the main insights and then it i worked with who my ex colleague who we worked with on one of these papers so uh, i've listed a series of papers and I, i'll sort of briefly summarize some of these but kind of most of this talk is going to be trying to go beyond these papers and simplify some of these ideas but if you really want to think about these ideas you should go to these uh but so without further ado so what do i think are the problems like what 
what was wrong in the way we normally think about online decision making? Uh, the first one I think is actually not that controversial. And like many of us realize that men, these problems can be formulated as MDP. The one I gave you couldn't be formulated as an MDP, but maybe I could have told you there's some distribution, let's say some known distribution. You can write an MDP, all MDPs have optimal solutions. Um, and we're sort of used to this idea that you have the curse of dimensionality. If, if the problem is big enough, the state space is big enough, you're not going to be able to solve the MDP. For me, the bigger issue with the MDP is actually, once you know that something is optimal, that doesn't really give you that much intuition about what the optimal looks like. So the optimal is some weird like lookup table which you construct using like backward dynamic programming, but you're not getting as much intuition about like, for example, is it a like, is it a threshold policy or is it an index policy? When is that the case? And, um, but this is something which at least in a while we've been thinking a lot about and there's a, there's a huge amount of amazing work on thinking about like other benchmarks and kind of other ways of thinking about these problems which give more intuition. So I'll give you one version of this from my work which I found a little surprising. And, and this is now a much more practical version of the problem I showed you. So it's the same setting as before, but now I want to do dynamic pricing. So in particular, each agent now has a continuum of values drawn from, let's say some IID distribution, every, um, and I can show a set of finite prices. People I know get really upset at this when I say I can show a set of finite prices. For some reason, every place I've lived in, this is not a bad assumption, but perhaps in some places that's not the case, but for the moment we have finite prices and all I can do is, now I don't have a take it or leave it offer, but someone comes and gives me a price or someone comes in, I offer them a price and they take it or leave it. So I've kind of changed the roles where the seller is now proposing the price and the buyer is taking it or leaving it. And the aim now is to choose prices to maximize revenue. So this is a highly well, like highly studied problem in operations research. It's kind of at the core of this field called revenue management. Um, one of the seminal works in this area is this paper by Greg and Van Rijsen all the way back in 93, where they basically tried explaining what the optimal policy is. Now the optimal policy I've said is complex. It's not that complex. It's a one dimensional DP. You can just write it down. It's easy to solve. Um, in some cases, so this is the case where if the distributions are exponential and you have continuous prices, then you can find it in closed form. And it has this weird looking form. Um, it is what it is, but the question that we were interested in is, as soon as we slightly complicate this, none of these techniques work. So is there some other benchmark which is not optimal, but which does almost as well as the optimal policy? And how would we construct something like this? And now I can't really use any binary support. I have some finite set of prices. So, so how do I construct this? Um, the spoiler alert is there is such a benchmark. So this is something from my paper with Alberto and Itai. Um, where what we're doing is we're looking at a, the same dynamic pricing policy, but we are looking at it for small problems. So we can explicitly calculate the offline optimal policy. Um, and the offline optimal policy, sorry, the online optimal policy, the solution to the DP. And now we are normalizing everything. So the online optimal policy is actually at zero. So this line here is the sort of optimal policy. The red line is a policy that we came up with, which is not the optimal policy. It's something else that I, we came up with and that I'll talk about later. And you can see, it feels like it's sometimes going below zero, but like at least zero is always within the confidence interval. So it's extremely close to optimal. What's more interesting is this thing over here, the offline policy, which is some kind of easy benchmark that we've been able to construct, um, which we can prove is just a constant additive amount away from the optimal even though we can't really explain what the optimal policy is. And, and my claim is if you're looking at practical problems in online decision-making, this sort of thing is there all over the place. And if you are looking for the true optimal, optimal policy, you may miss the fact that there are much simpler benchmarks which just give you a lot more information about the problem. Okay, so that's see that, issue see that. one. Uh, yes. This one here, Jim, the go ahead. this one. So the time horizon, uh, the gap seems uh, stationary. Doesn't matter yeah. how long the time horizon is. Yeah, so that's why I'm calling it constant regret. So it's it's order one independent of the budget and independent of the time horizon. It, it's some absolute constant. It depends on the distribution, but that's it. Mm -hmm. I can't see Jim's face, but his voice sounded skeptical. 
Right. You're talking about cumulative amount, uh, total amount of uh, revenue, total amount of budget, right? Yeah. So the total revenue is actually increasing linearly as I'm making the problem bigger. Right. But so, the loss in optimality is just literally a constant. Yeah, that is truly impressive. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, now, why is this useful? Well, as I go to bigger problems, if I scale it even further, um, I, I just have no way of computing the optimal policy anymore. But I do have this benchmark. And I can compare myself against the benchmark. And that's what we're doing over here. So this policy down here is the policy that we proposed. Uh, it's called Rabbi, which stands for Resolve and Bound Based on the Bellman Inequalities. In case anyone's offended, we asked Itai, and he said that's fine. Um, but the thing I'm comparing against this thing on top is the policy of Geiger and Sunrise. And that's actually the static pricing policy, which they proved is at most square root t, but it's actually exactly square root t. Um, and the point is, you're basically, we are able to say something about very large problems, even without knowing what the optimal policy is. Okay, so that was example one. The second problem, and this I do think is a little more prevalent, um, and it's what I'm calling the corrupting influence of minimax thinking. So what do I mean by that? Um, so many of us do re recognize that the optimal policy is just not worth thinking about. It. It's too unwieldy. It's, 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 there's not enough structure in it. So what we often do is we say that, well, let's can think of some more restricted version of the problem. So maybe I'll look at a restricted class of instances or a restricted class of inputs, and then try to find the maximize the minimum reward I can get within that instance. And, and there are many versions of this. So if you're doing something like distribution agnostic, there is some unknown distribution. I don't know it. I'm learning it, the banded framework. Um, if you do something like a robust algorithm, or if you do adversarial, you're always thinking about some set of a minimax problem. So you're imagining a set of problems which you want to compete against, or a set of instances you want to compete against, and you're finding an algorithm which does the best on the worst of such instances. The problem is these algorithms typically do exactly the same on every such instance. That's really what comes about when you think of a minimax problem that, that's sort of baked into the minimax theorem. Um, if you play the minimax policy, it's typically as bad no matter what the input is. And this is not just in theory, this is in practice. And to give you another example, I'll turn to another of my favorite problems. Um, so this is something in CS, it's called the, net, uh, the online packing problem. In OR and OM, this is called network revenue management. So it's the same as before the, the knapsack problem, but now I have multiple knapsacks. So I have multiple sort of different resources. So think of these as different airplanes and so seats on different flights. So a flight from Ithaca to in the good old days when we were flying around, we have a flight from Ithaca to Detroit, we have a flight from Detroit to SF. Um, and if I bought one seat on both, I could be in SF. Uh, now the point is each person is now coming in and they're saying exactly what they need to buy and they have to buy both. So if a person says, I want to buy a seat on A and B, you have to sell them a seat on A and B. There's no point just selling them one. Um, and then they are offering you a sort of total payment for both the seats. So I've again sort of switched back to the, the offer version of the problem. Um, and as before we have finite capacity, so B1, B2 up to BD for each resource. And each agent comes in with this type which is what they want and how much they're willing to pay. Um, and I need to decide whether to sell to them or not. Now, unlike the knapsack that we did in the beginning, this problem is already harder because the state space is much larger. So in particular, the size of the state space in this problem, if you think about it, it's something like T times B1 times B2 up to BD. And so you really don't want to solve the whole dynamic program in this. Um, However, in this case, there actually is a very simple benchmark. So one benchmark that you can try using is what's called the hindsight benchmark, which is imagine a offline controller who knows all the inputs in advance. So they know the entire sample path and they're taking the optimal algorithm with respect to that, um, or, or they're taking optimal actions with respect to the entire sample path. Um, what people have studied, and we are by far not the first to study this, um, is well, how well do you do compared to this hindsight optimal? So how well do you do against a, a controller who knows all information? Uh, and here is a sort of laundry list of papers which look at it. Um, and these are all really amazing. Um, I, like, and, and it's also a very small subset of there. There are way more of these. Um, roughly speaking, there are two classes of this. So one is if you have arbitrary arrival processes, um, in particular, if they could like depend on the time and do all sorts of weird things, well, 
Then there's a line of work looking at constant factor competitive algorithms. So what I mean by that is they get a multiplicative factor of the optimum. Um, and you can show that the regret in that case is actually linear in time. And it, it's linear both, it's an upper bound, but you can also show lower bound. Uh, and there's a long line of work in thinking about what are called profit inequalities, which do exactly this. Uh, for this particular problem that I showed you, online packing, there's actually a quote unquote optimal, or uh, to be fair to them, they call it a near optimal algorithm. Um, so this is a paper by um, Devaner, Jen, Sivan, and Wilkins. I think it was in JCM last year. It's a really amazing piece of work to get like the optimal or a near optimal competitive ratio for this, but the algorithm fundamentally has linear regret. Now, on the other hand, if you fix the arrival process, if you can't have an arbitrary arrival process, but you fix it and then scale time, um, we know, again, there's a lot of work in OR which says you can get sublinear regret. Um, in particular, in Gariga and Van Rijzen and a follow-up paper in 97 showed that you, there's a policy which gets a square root T regret as the horizon changes. And, um, and this is fundamental. You, their, their example does get square root T. Um, there were a bunch of improvements after that, which sort of improve it to like sublinear in, in square or sub square root T. Um, the most impressive version of these improvements until our work was this work by uh, Stephanie Jason and Sunil Kumar, where they showed that under a certain additional requirement called dual non-degeneracy, you get constant regret, but the constant depends on the non-degeneracy parameter. So, and as you get closer to being degenerate, um, it again goes back up to square root T, and this is fundamental. So the short summary of all of this is, in all of these works, you get something with scales with T, it's either square root T or linear in T. And if you look at the instances people look at, you actually also get lower bounds. So this is fundamental. What else can we do? Well, we can ask, okay, is there some sense of a realistic, uh, some notion of a realistic arrival processes? Like, am I happy sort of looking at a much smaller set of arrival processes or a different set of arrival processes? Um, and again, if I look at arrival processes with finite types and where the process itself doesn't depend on capital T, so you sort of fix the distribution up front and then scale time, it turns out you get constant regret. So, so this is, at least in my mind, this idea of like the corruption of the adversarial thinking. Um, we didn't really pick the right adversary, or at least I feel like this is a much more reasonable adversary to look at. And again, all of a sudden you're getting constant regret. Um, I do want to say a little bit more about this algorithm because I'll come back and talk about this. So this was the algorithm that we proposed. This is in this paper by uh, Albert, uh, by Alberto and me. Um, I think the first version was in Sigmetrics in 2019. And the algorithm we proposed was as follows. So we said, well, this is like a meta algorithm. So first imagine there's a predictive oracle. So there's an oracle who is somehow doing some machine learning or simulation or whatever have you, and it's sort of finding out this probability that the offline solution, so the solution in hindsight, will decrease if you take a certain action. So another way of saying it is, I'm, I'm at some time t, I have some budget, um, some vector of budget, and I'm looking to accept or regret, and I'm trying to understand, well, what's the probability in hindsight we will regret if we accept this arrival? Now, if you have such an object, and if you think a bit about this in, let's say, a Bayesian decision theoretic way, a very natural thing to do is to threshold this probability. So if I give you the probability of regretting in hindsight, you say, well, if that probability of regretting is less than 0.5, I'll go with the action, otherwise I won't. There are just two actions, accept or regret, so this makes sense. Um, in fact, if, if this truly was a Bayesian decision theory problem, this would be the optimal thing to do. It's not because there are, it's not optimal because it's sequential, but nevertheless, it's a natural thing to do. And um, what we really showed is that under the very mild tail bounds on the arrival process, um, the regret of this simple self algorithm is actually independent of the state space and time. Um, now you may complain a little bit that, well, that's interesting, but it, it's somewhat meta because where the hell are we getting these probabilities? Uh, but it actually turns out you can do a little more work and show that there are very simple ways of constructing it. So in particular, the one we use is based on what's called the resolve fluid LP. And then you take the solution of this LP and you threshold it exactly following the same ideas. And, and you actually get an exact regret characterization or okay, at least you get an upper bound and the upper bound depends on the maximum value that anyone is willing to pay. And it depends on the distribution. So this is what I was telling Jim earlier, but it does not depend on time on the budgets at all. 
this very simple expression, which just sort of gives you, and, and it's actually quite loose. Um, so one thing I will mention is the original version of this was proposed by this lovely paper by Itai Gurvich and Alessandro Alberto. Um, they were somewhat surprised by the their result and they actually thought it only worked in one dimension. And, and I think most people thought it was a bit of a curiosity, but it's actually something much more fundamental. Um, and maybe the second thing is this genuinely does work. So here's a much more complicated problem where I'm looking at like a network revenue management with like multiple items, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm scaling it. Uh, I'll talk about these two policies on top a little later, but the policy at the bottom is there. So compared to the hindsight optimal solution, we're literally getting a constant. And um, yeah, so at least for this problem, as far as we know, this is like the only algorithm which does this, but it pretty much completely solves this set of things. Questions? Uh, I have a clarification yeah. question. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you uh, went over the previous work and then you said that under realistic arrivals, you get constant regret. You briefly mentioned what realistic arrival meant. Can you repeat that? I, I missed uh, that. Yeah, so what I'm assuming is that I have a finite set of types. So a type was defined as the vector of like the requirements and the values. I'm saying there's a finite set of these. I see. And mm -hmm. I have a distribution over this finite set. But then the second re requirement is that this distribution which I'm choosing, I'm fixing it first and then scaling the problem. I'm not allowing, I'm not doing a joint scaling of the distribution and the probability. So, and, and you can sort of see in the bounds that my, this, my bound does depend on the probability. So this is the bound for the IID setting. And it depends on the probability. It's, it's a somewhat weaker bound. But um, so this could scale with T and you would get a really bad bound. But I'm not allowing that. I see. I see. Thanks. Good question. Okay. Um, follow up, sorry, I have a follow up oh, yeah, sure. to this question. Um, so, in terms of the uh, assumptions you impose on the arrival rate, I, I think that's very interesting. But uh, do you, for these bounds, do you assume some sort of stationarity in terms of the arrival process, or it can be time no. varying, meaning that the reward can be time, can be time dependent? Yeah, so it can be time and it can be time dependent. So this could, for example, be like a, a time varying Poisson process. It can actually be Markovian. It can be correlated. What we really need is sort of formally we need that uh, if you look at the residual process for each type, that has some concentration, and most processes satisfy that. So I'm, I won't do the. Uh, I'll maybe talk a little bit about this later, but this is extremely general um, in terms of what it covers. It really just needs the finiteness and 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 the fact that you don't scale it with time. And as a decision maker, do I need to know uh, certain information about this arrival rate if it's time varying, or I don't need to know that? That's an excellent question, and I will use that as a segue for my third problem that I think people have when they think about online decision making, which is that when we are thinking about these complex problems, we actually often combine these two ideas of well. A, I need to explore and learn the model. And B, I need to somehow, this problem is difficult and I need to approximate it. And this is perhaps the most pervasive of like all my like gripes that I have with how we talk about online decision-making. We never separate these two. We sort of jump in and say, there's an approximation problem, there's an exploration problem, um, but we are just gonna throw away the approximation problem because that's difficult and pretend we don't even know what problem we are solving and learn everything. Uh, and the reason for this, I mean, we've, all seen and read a lot about bandit or more recently about reinforcement learning. But if you kind of step back a bit and think about it, this is somewhat ridiculous. Like why should these two be on the same play? Like why should we compare them in an apples to oranges way? These are just two very different phenomena. So exploration and approximation by on the face of it have nothing to do with each other. But typically when we look at bounds, we sort of combine everything and say log D. Um, does this make a difference? Yes, and this sort of hopefully will answer Jing's question. So everything that I said before, I was assuming we know the distribution. However, if the distribution, if all you know is that the arrivals are IID, well, you can just run it with the plugin estimator and it'll still work. You'll still get constant regret. However, if you had to sell in order to learn what the value was, so if there was some form of demand sensing, the guy came and told you, I won't tell you how much I'm willing to pay until you sell me the item. Um, well, then you need log T. Uh, 
And the log t is coming fundamentally because of exploration. It's nothing to do with approximation. So that's interesting. I actually think that is kind of uninteresting because it doesn't tell me how we would practically solve these problems. Here's something which I find much more interesting, which is, well, what if we had one sample path of data from yesterday? So, or, or like a few sample paths of data, which you think are representative of what the distribution is today. Um, and the short answer is you can just take like literally one sample path and you still get back constant regret. Uh, this is what it looks like. So I'm again looking at, I think this was again for network revenue management. Uh, I've compared to a bunch of algorithms. Well, firstly, if I just give you one sample path of data and I just tell you today's data, it looks the same. Um, there aren't really any algorithms which do that. The, so what we did was we actually compared ourselves to um, these things here. So these are sort of these adversarial or these competitive algorithms, which I said have linear regret and, and they genuinely do have linear regret, even if you tune them based on the data. Um, and this thing in blue is us using just one sample path. So what I mean by one sample path is I saw all the arrivals which came in yesterday, what they wanted and how much they were willing to pay and then fed it into today's problem. Literally just took the empirical distribution, it works. Okay, so one last complaint about how people think about online decision-making. Um, what people often do is when they think about these problems, they, even if they don't fall into these other traps, they often go, well, solving the underlying problem, even if I had all the data is really difficult. And maybe I don't want to solve it. Maybe I want to sort of like claim that something is NP hard and therefore say that there's no hope of doing this. Um, and this is often true but it's misleading because online versions of many of these problems can actually often be much easier. And this is like many of us have thought a lot about this. I don't know if Dave's online, but there's one problem which like Dave Goldberg has worked, worked a lot on. Um, my favorite version of this was something I'd done with Daniel Friend where we were thinking about these ideas from the previous paper. Oh, Dave's online, hey Dave. Um, and we were thinking about some of these like ideas and we said, well, what if we try using it for bin packs? in particular vector bin packing. So I have a set of clouds. So this is my ECE background. So I'm thinking about a cloud computing system. Uh, there are virtual machines with a, a vector of resources, memory, processing time, et cetera. Jobs come in and they have some minimum, uh, it's a vector of minimum resource requirements. And then each job can be loaded on some existing virtual machine, which has enough available resources. So it, it's like, I remember there was an old talk by Sasha Stoliar where he had this beautiful animation of this like jigsaw puzzle where you have all of these, let's say these are these boxes and then you have a job coming in and then you put it in this slot over here and then you have another job coming in which looks like this and then you also put it in this slot over here and then the third job is too big and it doesn't fit and then you put it here. In case anyone got surprised, yes, Sasha did have animations in the talk he did. Um, you should try and ask him about it. But so this is the problem we are trying to solve. Uh, we have these weird rectangles coming in. They have, again, a finite set of rectangles and some, some distribution over these. And we want to fit it and we want to minimize the number of virtual machines we open. Um, and we have a finite number of them or like a finite horizon of these jobs coming and we want to do this. Uh, if I gave you all the jobs up front, you are trying to solve online bin packing, which isn't an easy problem, but, but it's actually got pretty nice approximations in particular if the number of jobs are much larger than the number of types of jobs. So that's the regime we want to consider. The, there are a few types of jobs, there are a very large number of jobs. And what Daniel and I showed is, again, you can use some of these ideas and get an algorithm which gets constant additive regret for vector bin packing as well. So what we're plotting here is the same we are sort of looking at this algorithm, but now I'm plotting it in log plot. So we have these like existing algorithms, which are, um, are which kind of get, I think this was like square root T behavior. And then this is what we get, which eh, sort of a straight line, it's kind of flat. But you can provably show it's constant regret. Okay, so, so that was the, the diatribe part of my talk. So what did I talk about? Um, what I think is wrong, and at least in the way we, we talk about, we teach, we think about online decision-making is, well, I'm kind of boiling it down to these four. We, we often think about optimality. If we don't, we start thinking in a minimax sense. We somehow combine 
like learning and approximation all in the same same sort of melange and then look at it and and sometimes we try saying that problems are difficult computationally when they truly are not um daniel is saying the thing is flat so this is flat for youtube uh, okay so what can we do about this and this gets me to the answer to what i started off with um Uh, so the two gentlemen I showed in the first slide, the one on the right, a lot of you realized was the great David Black. Well, um, the one on the left is Wolfgang Doblin, um, who is in my mind one of the most underappreciated, but like one of the most remarkable probabilists ever. Uh, if if you don't know who this is, please go right now or maybe after the talk and check out who Wolfgang Doblin is and and just be amazed at what he's done. The the thing that Uh, Wolfgang Doblin can really come in most talks that we give as a like a for as creating the tools that we use. But the particular tool that I'm interested in was something he created in 1938, where he came up with the first known application of the coupling method in, for a problem of like ergodicity of Markov chains. Uh, so why am I referring to these two people? Well, the way I propose we think about online decision making is as follows. So. instead of thinking about the optimal or a set of adversaries um i want to first always frame the problem as that of picking a benchmark so we want to pick a benchmark which is in somehow appropriate enough for the problem we consider as we change problems the benchmark may change um and we'll take everything we want about like it should be more computationally efficient it should sort of reflect the underlying space etc cetera, etc cetera, and put all of that into the benchmark so there'll be some amount of work in like crafting this benchmark but once we have this benchmark um I then want to use sort of sample path coupling idea to try and show you how well we do with respect to this benchmark. Um, and the reason I showed sort of Blackwell and Doblin is like the idea of like comparing against a benchmark, at least in my mind, is fundamentally goes back to the amazing work of Blackwell and thinking about Blackwell approachability. He, of course, thought of it in a in, in a much more general sense, but like the idea is kind of embedded there. Um, and coupling, in my mind, all of the techniques that we talked about earlier. to an extent one really probabilistic technique these were more of ideas we borrowed from optimization and we tried to fit it onto like these probabilistic questions um coupling in my mind is at least one of the the purely probabilistic ways in which we think about these systems which you, which you really can't do unless you're in a stochastic setting and and it is when it works it's just incredibly powerful so how do i propose to do it well firstly what's the benchmark and if i tell you i'm going to use a benchmark most of you would think that maybe what i want is some kind of upper bound on the optimal policy um i actually claim we don't even need an upper bound and I, it's often good to just step away from the upper bound and just think about any policy which gives a meaningful reference it, it need not be an upper bound you can sort of clean it up later and and do something with it but just let's think about any policy um and in fact a very natural benchmark is well, the best policy that you know right now so maybe you have some policy that you've been working with i'm calling it the status quo um and maybe you want to see well can i do better than that and and this turns out to be really important when you think about things like policy improvement and reinforcement learning you start with a policy and then you prove that you improve compared to that so your benchmark is something that you have at hand um there's a very large class of these benchmarks coming from well i think from control theory and in what are called certainty equivalent benchmarks um if you're in or or in applied probability you may sort of think of these as fluid benchmarks the, the main idea at least that there, there are many ways of constructing this but roughly speaking what all of them do is they take certain constraints which are sample path wise and replace them with expectation or expected values of uh, versions of these constraints so this is if you haven't thought about fluid benchmarks this way go back and think a bit about like the fluid like fluid models but this is really what you're doing you're replacing sample path constraints with expectation constraints and um, so this is clearly typically an upper bound but then again you can have fluid benchmarks which are ne not necessarily upper bounds another class of benchmarks and again i'm using the control terminology is something called a receding horizon benchmark and the idea here is maybe you see somewhat into the future so you have a few steps ahead of look ahead or a few steps of look ahead and you use that to sort of optim optimize greedily over your look ahead window but then you don't know what's coming up after that um and and the more general version of these kind of look ahead benchmarks is what's called a oracle benchmark or what i'm calling an oracle benchmark where the idea is well you can generalize this and say there is some natural filtration which is 
being used by your policy and imagine any filtration which is richer than the natural filtration so imagine any policy which has some extra information um and is using that in any way it feels like uh so something like a bandit problem where you're comparing against someone who knows the optimal amount that is a an oracle benchmark but then also the the hindsight benchmark that i was looking at where i said what if you know all the distribution or the arrivals that's an oracle benchmark um and then finally you don't you can sort of combine these in weird ways so you can take sort of things which are partly receding horizon or sorry partly oracle partly certainty equivalent and then maybe relax it and still get like weird benchmarks which don't fall into any of these um and the thing that i did in the dynamic pricing example was exactly that so so here's the benchmark that we set up uh so what we are thinking about is we are thinking about an online uh, offline controller the offline controller does not know the true values because that's too much if i tell you the true values well you would charge people exactly what they're willing to pay you can't compete against that um but what the controller knows is they he knows the the histogram of all the people coming in the future so at time 1 i give you the histogram of v1 v2 v3 up to v capital t and then at the end of each period um the offline has to choose a price and then the offline is actually told what the true value is so offline can update his histogram so this piece over here would be what i would think of as a oracle benchmark but it's it's a somewhat odd oracle like i'm not giving you the exact arrivals i'm sort of giving you the histogram of all the arrivals what i'm doing here is actually a relaxation and so what i'm saying is even if i give you the histogram you would need to solve a dynamic program to figure out what prices to choose um and that's too much i don't want to solve the dynamic program what if you just choose the optimal price for that histogram like pretend it was a static problem that you picked a random person from the histogram and choose the optimal price for that now why i'm saying this is a relaxation is because this may not actually be optimal so given this extra information you may actually end up with a policy which is worse than the optimal policy but that's still fine it, it's a valid benchmark to look against uh, we can afterwards go in and clean it up and say well when is it not optimal how far away is it from optimal and get bounce from that uh however if you just look at how well it performs this is what we are using in this plot below so we're showing that if you use this benchmark this benchmark is with extremely high probability always better than the mdp solution and but it's always within an additive constant uh said so just a uh, clarification um so uh, can you give a simple example where it were, like you you can actually do better than this benchmark um so so not not in a online way but if i gave you the information about the histogram you could solve the dp so you could sort of take the histogram in the future and say by exchangeability i know the next thing is like a random arrival from the histogram and then if i set a certain price i may sell i may not sell i will go to a different histogram with some probability and then i keep optimizing so even in a two stage version of this you can show that choosing the static optimal price is not optimal sorry i think i'm a little bit lost uh, can you define the setting again and slowly go over which benchmark you're talking about yeah sorry so the setting is what i've written here so i have a fixed budget fixed number of people arriving each person has the id value from some unknown distribution and then i can set a finite set of prices now nice. what i'm saying is imagine an offline benchmark who knows the histogram of all the arrivals in the future which is more information than you have um and that histogram keeps getting updated after the period so you can't you can sort of use the histogram to decide what price to show and then it's updated later on so what does it mean i mean if i know the histogram then why would i want to update it because you have a finite budget so it's still a ndp so if i tell you like think of this as the the randomized secretary secretary model where you have like a set of values and a random order of those are showing up the optimal thing is not a static policy some complicated dynamic policy um this is in cs this is called the profit secretary for weird reasons but the optimal is still very complicated So what we are saying is ignore that and just do the the static price compared to this histogram. I see. Okay. Other questions? So yeah, I mean it is somewhat surprising that this is 
always better than the MDP, but it's within a constant additive of the MDP. Like uh, it, it, this took a fair bit of work. So this is in this paper, the Bellman inequalities. Um, it, it's not an obvious claim. But okay, what do I do with these benchmarks? I mean, suppose I show you something like this. Um, I still haven't given a policy. I've just sort of told you there's a benchmark which you can use, which is easier than the optimal. So how do I think about policies? And this is where I want to introduce this idea of the compensated coupling. So before I sort of, I will show you a cartoon of what exactly I'm thinking about it before formalizing it. But the basic idea is the problem with thinking about some kind of complicated offline policy or an offline benchmark is the benchmark keeps changing its decisions. And after some time, so you're taking a set of decisions, the benchmark is taking a set of decisions. Initially, you started off in the same state, but after some time, your states have to speak up. So each of you are on some different budget level and then you're taking decisions and it feels impossible to compare. So the main thing that we want to do in this, this coupling is you both started off in the same state. We want to somehow keep maintaining both the processes in exactly the same state. So the online algorithm which we are analyzing and the benchmark should always have exactly the same state over the, the this over any sample path. Um, but, but now we somehow need to, every time we sort of, okay, so one way of thinking, like in pictures, what I'm saying is we have some state and I'm showing you one like sample path of this algorithm. So maybe this is your budget process. The offline algorithm sold to this person, then sold to this person, then sold to this person. Now, online is planning to do something different. So in particular, at T1, online didn't realize that he should sell um, and decided not to sell instead. So at this point, the two states, spaces, the two states have decoupled. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna insist that offline take exactly the same action as online and somehow figure out how much we need to compensate offline for this suboptimality. So offline wanted to do something else, um, by taking a different action, its reward has changed. And I want to sort of add a correction term which makes its, which bounds its change. Now at this point, after offline changes its action, it may actually change the entire trajectory of future actions. So it's not as obvious in this picture, but like my future trajectory has changed. But then I sort of keep moving on until I see the next point of, of conflict between the two algorithms. I again force offline to do the same thing as online. I again compensate it, keep continuing this process. So keep this picture at the back of your mind and let me try and formalize this a bit. So the way I'm thinking of it is I have some MDP over like a finite horizon. Um, and I have two controllers or two policies, one of them, which is non-anticipatory. So it's my online policy. And then I have this benchmark, which could be very strange, um, but it, it's on the same state space and same action space. Now. What online is doing is well, online is adapted to the natural filtration, whereas offline could be adapted to something which is a richer filtration. So it could have some information about the future. And I can sort of use these filtrations and define a very natural notion of a value function for each. So given a certain time and a certain state, online is thinking, well, how much would I earn in expectation if I take a like if I take the optimal or if I play whatever action I want to, um, starting at time a uh, time t at state s. Offline is thinking the same thing, but this is now adapted to GT. So in particular, since if we are thinking about everything with respect to FT, then this is a constant, um, whereas this is a random variable. Since GT could be richer than FT. Now, I'm going to follow just the online algorithm. So I'm going to run the online algorithm and I will define the states, actions, and rewards only with from the point of view of online. So that's what S, A, and R are. But I'm gonna try and bound the value function of the offline algorithm, the benchmark, with respect to this sample path. And my claim is, well, I want the offline guy to take the action that online is taking. But what I can do is, I know the offline had some value function initially. If he takes the action I ask him to take, he's gonna get a reward, and he's going to get some value function in the future state that he ends up in. But this, is, this may not be optimal, right? Like that's why he wasn't taking it or, or for whatever reason, he didn't want to take this action. And so whatever is the difference, I am going to sort of compensate via this random variable delta t. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a sort of, this inequality here is in the sense of stochastic domination. But, but the nice thing is 
all all we are really saying is offline wanted to do something and he had a certain idea of how much value he would get um online forced him to do something else you need to pay him the difference of what he would get if he did something else and then continued doing what he was doing in the future versus what you may what he wanted to do that's all that delta t represents and now the trivial thing is you can sort of continue this process and just do it at for each time um all of these terms are going to sort of cancel out by telescoping all of this stuff is going to add up and get you the total reward that online got and so if you just telescope this what you'll get is that the regret so the value of offline initially minus the value of online initially is bounded by the sum of these compensation terms um and this is not a statement in expectation this is actually a sample path statement all of these delta t's are potentially random variables so i've basically given you a decomposition of the regret in terms of a collection of random variables and that's what i'm calling the compensated coupling um i'm going to show i have roughly 10 minutes that's it okay so i'm going to show a few examples of trying to use this but before i go there any questions So forget all the if the notation confuses you. Don't worry too much about that. All I'm saying is, the online algorithm is trying to take an action. The benchmark may be taking a different action. If we ask the benchmark to do what the online algorithm does, we need to pay the difference to bench the benchmark, in order to make sure that its value function remains the same or at least it's, it's upper bounded. And now I can sort of keep on adding up these these compensation variables, and I get a decomposition for it. Right? So in computing this, Sid, the key ingredient is that you can compute this, uh, th these value functions, well, the, sorry, the offline value function according to this policy. Yeah. Okay. And you. I'll show you an example why, how, like, and this example is actually not by me, but I, I find it kind of miraculous how to do it. Um, should I maybe just go on to the example? Um, okay, so let me do that first. So. the example i want to show you and i'll come back to the other stuff but i'm going to go back to the unit demand knapsack this is the thing i started off with right at the beginning and i'm no longer going to assume that there are only two types of arrivals but now i'll have a continuous type of arrivals in particular i'm going to assume that every arrival can take a value which is uniform in 0 1 um this was an example which i thought a lot about and i couldn't figure out what the right answer is although i had conjectured it should be log t and there was a, an amazing result by rob bray last year where he gave essentially a three line proof that it is log t and as with any three line proof that means i will show it to you so is the setting clear so i'm going to show you for the online knapsack unit demo the true regret in hindsight is exactly log t how do i do this so i'm going to use the compensated coupling so this was this weird form of the compensated coupling the rough idea is i somehow need to estimate these compensation terms and think of this picture below so so I, i'm at some time t okay this is any time during the evolution of this process and i have some budget b which is less than the original budget and um i have h periods in the future that's why i'm introducing this h that's the sort of remaining horizon so this is the way rob thought about the problem so he said well okay um the online is going to use a threshold policy that it doesn't make sense not to so he's going to okay suppose the online at the end of the day is going to use some threshold so he'll choose a threshold theta he's going to accept if the current value is more than the threshold reject on it you can convince yourself this is the only thing that is worth doing here um and so suppose the threshold is theta and i've plotted theta it's some number between 0 and 1 i'm going to accept the current value if it's larger than that the offline guy well he is ignoring today's value and he's thinking about all the values from tomorrow till the end of time me saying well i could accept at most small b of d so the marginal value that i'm accepting in the future is the bth largest of everyone in the future and he sort of takes that quantity and plots it over here he knows exactly what it is that's why i'm indicating it's an orange he knows the the solvent value so how do i compensate this guy well so here's the amazing idea so the idea is let's look at the current value vt and think about where it could land well it could land it could be smaller than theta but that's great that means both me and offline are rejecting it it could be bigger than this boundary this marginal value 
So that's also great. We are both accepting it. It's bigger than the be it largest or the future. So that's amazing. So the only place where you have a disagreement is this set in between, between theta and V. But moreover, you actually know the exact value of the disagreement. If you accept this guy, you're going to reject the marginal guy in the future. The loss is exactly this delta T over here. Right? Because you're accepting him, you're rejecting something bigger. That's how much you lose. So this is kind of formally the loss that you have. I've assumed here that theta is less than V, but it doesn't matter. You can do a symmetric argument the other way. And now here are the three lines of his proof. Um, he said, if I want to look at expected value of delta T, well, I first, I do it in two stages. First, I take expectation over the current arrival and then over the future. Well, if I take expectation of the current, I have a uniform distribution over here and I'm looking at this distance, I'm going to get delta squared over two. And so that's what I've written here. In particular, you're going to get the boundary squared or the gap squared divided by two. Um, this is assuming you know the minimum of the future or the bth or the statistic of the future. But that's not a problem because these are all uniform. So we actually know exactly what this is. So well, first we have to choose theta, but minimizing this by choosing theta is the same as you'll choose this to be the expected value. So that's going to get you the variance of this. But now you can literally go and look at Wikipedia. Like if you look at Wikipedia for all the statistics of the uniform distribution, you'll see that this is order one over h. Take this and plug it into this, you're done. Order log t. Long dramatic pause, but I mean, I just find that quite a remarkable little argument. Um, hopefully this answers Shane's question that like here's a case where you can exactly figure out what it is. And you can also show it's tight from below. Um, so as to not only give credit to Rob, let me tell you a little bit about what we had done. So what we had done was something very similar when we first thought about the compensated coupling, but instead of bounding it by the exact compensation, we said, well, we can bound it by the maximum value of the compensation at each time times the probability that we make a mistake. These were the two green and the one red regions that I looked, showed you in Rob's plot. Um, and then we said, well, maybe I should always take the action which minimizes this probability that I disagree with the benchmark. It's exactly what I defined as the base selector. Uh, and the cleanest version of this result I know was actually something I, I wrote with Daniel where we showed that under a set of very mild assumptions, in particular, we want to assume that the arriving types are independent of the state and the actions are exchangeable. So the, action, the, the reward only depends on the number of times you take a certain action when a certain arrival shows up. So it only depends on state action counts in hindsight. Um, if you have these two assumptions, plus if you assume that the set of types is finite and the function is Lipschitz, you always get a constant regret. And all the examples I showed before, except for the dynamic pricing, um, so bin parking, network revenue management, et cetera, they're all special cases of this kind of more general geometric view of why this is working. Um, and the rough reason is if you again go into look at the compensated coupling, I, I need to somehow tell you what's the probability of making an error for every action. Now I can't do it for every action, but I can prove to you that there's at least one action where the error is exponentially small. Now I can add it up and I get a constant. Um, here I am using the fact that it's finite, so the errors can't sort of jump around too much. Um, in some sense, what I did was like a infinity one bound on, like I did Hilda's inequality on the on this delta, whereas what Rob did was he kind of went in and really analyzed it. So he showed that the infinity, not, like the infinity one bound doesn't work. So if I just bound this measure, that's not going to work. That's actually going to be square root t in total. But if you actually look at the true compensation, you're going to get log t. I'm going to skip what I was going to say next, but the slides are already online. So what I was going to also show you is that the compensated coupling generalizes many of the other regret decompositions you would have seen. So any of you who works in reinforcement learning and you think about something like the Dan latimer brunskill decomposition or, which, or the optimistic reinforcement learning decomposition, um, that's a special case of the compensated coupling, assuming that the offline is adapted to FT and it's the optimal policy. Um, if you do the same thing, but say offline is any other policy pi hat, but it's still adapted to FT, you get this thing called the performance difference lemma, which is kind of at the core of the old result by Kakade and Langford, which is at the core of thinking about things like 
policy gradient measure. So it's like all of this just fall out as like one line corollaries of the statement. Um, if you think about policies, if you think about anticipatory benchmarks, the benchmarks which have extra information, um, then you get the family of what are called information relaxations, which are basically essentially, uh, okay, at least the way I think of them are, these are the optimal look ahead policies with some look ahead and with a, a penalty term. So we sort of look at this delta T, try to understand what its structure is and, and then get certain penalties. Um, these are really useful for doing things like getting upper bounds, but they're often pretty hard to compute. Um, and so what we did in our second paper, the one on the Bellman inequalities was basically gave a much more user-friendly way of, like, I think user-friendly way of using these kind of information relaxations, like how do you construct them? What are good information relaxations? How do you use them in a wide variety of settings? So this is a much more technical thing, so I'm not gonna talk about this, but um, feel free to look at the paper for like what, what's the Bellman inequalities and how do we use this? Uh, and, I, and the same idea actually also does work for adversarial benchmarks. This is a little more non-trivial, but uh, the cleanest version I know of it is in this amazing paper by Kalai and Vempala called the, uh, they introduce what's called the follow the perturb leader algorithm. But they basically also introduce the decomposition of regret in terms of what's called a stability and a penalty parameter. These, these terms were sort of introduced later, but roughly speaking, what they said is you always pay a cost for not tracking the optimal algorithm in, in hindsight, or some algorithm in hindsight, and, but that some algorithm may not be optimal and so there's a penalty. Um, and this also ties into this line of work on what's called the Burkholder's method, which is a min-max version of these kind of sample path arguments. Maybe another minute, is that fair? So I just want to give you a little sense of where we want to go next. Or, okay, maybe what I'll do is, um, so why am I excited about this way of thinking about it, uh, about online decision making? I feel like once you start thinking about these benchmarks and this idea of sample path coupling arguments, you, you can prove a lot of things which a priori you wouldn't even think about asking. So one thing which is beautiful about this whole framework is it's composable. If you have multiple policies, you can sort of compose the regret together. So in particular, you can think about this question of approximation versus exploration. And so I, I have an extension of Rob's result which shows for any um, sub-exponential distribution, you still get log t. But if you start learning them, then there's actually a separation. Like, so finite, like almost sure bounded distributions are much easier, others are harder, et cetera. Um, another thing you can do is you can go back and just, just start justifying the modeling choices you made. So Daniel sort of came up with this really nice insight that, uh, so this was a question with Sasha Stolia had asked me about when I told him about the bin packing result, he said, are you assuming finite horizon? And at that time I didn't think much about it, but I went back later and thought about it. and we realized that if you, instead of doing finite horizon, if you say do discounting, which is the same as a geometric horizon, um, then actually constant regret is uh, impossible. Now, this really, I mean, one thing you would say is, well, okay, finite horizon is too strong. Um, I would sort of frame it the other way. Why were we assuming discounting in the first place? This was a, a convenience we used because it gave us easier policies, but now I think the performance really matters. On that. And, and that for me is somewhat interesting. And, and the same thing for like thinking about average cost. Why are we assuming average cost? It, it's interesting mathematically, but do we really always need it? Um, and the thing I'm sort of really excited about right now is that once you start thinking about things this way, you can also look at multi-objective settings. So this is some work which Christina and I have been doing with our student Sean Sinclair, where we want to use these methods, but think about like individual guarantees in particular fairness guarantees. And so now once you have a notion of a, a benchmark, you can actually compete against the benchmark, but the entire vector of the benchmark. Instead of just saying, I compete against a single value, I want to look at the allocation the benchmark is giving each person and try to approximate that in some way. And, and what this says about like equity and fairness in different allocations. Um, if you're really, really interested in this stuff, um, one quick plug and I'll stop here. Um, so a bunch of us, so in particular, Tadaris Likuris, uh, Shipragarwal, Shuchi Chawla and me, uh, we've just gotten this program at Simon's Accepted. So we want to like get people from different fields and start thinking about these data-driven processes um, in just like how different fields think about it and like how this, the common ideas, but also the differences and like what, where can we push this field forward. Um, one reason we are also really excited about it, and this is somewhat appropriate given today's the first day of Black History Month, um, we also realized as we were thinking about it that all of us were somewhat greatly influenced by the work of David Blackwell. And sometimes the work of David Blackwell isn't appreciated enough in this field. And 
like how central it is to the way we think about these problems. So as part of this um, workshop, we, uh, this sem semester, we do want it to um, be a homage to like the work of David Blackwell and like spread that message somewhat further. So uh, the, I think this, like, this announcement is up online. Please check it out if you're free in fall 22. Hopefully we'll be allowed to travel and I will see you in Berkeley. And hopefully we'll be allowed to travel as well. And some of you can visit this other really beautiful place. Um, and with that, I'll stop. I'll clap on behalf of everyone. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Sid. And uh, well, I guess we'll have time for our questions. And please feel free to type your questions in the chat or raise your hands. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start. <laughs> well, I guess, I, I mean, I, I know we've already, we've already talked about this, but I want to hear again a little bit about um, the um, kind of the overall framework of if you given, let's say I give you a, 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 a kind of a new problem and how, what's the process you would go through to construct, like how do you tips and insights on how to construct a good benchmark and how to like, uh, what kind of properties or structures I need to compute these, like uh, these, how much the compensation? Are yeah, there... no, I mean, that's a great question. So, okay. Um, I, so I genuinely don't have a great idea. Like in the cases which I've shown you, I know how to construct the benchmark and I know exactly how I did it. Um, but if I go a little beyond it, I, I have some hunches, but I, I don't have a great idea. So to give you an example of where like the simplest problem where I don't really know what a good benchmark is. Um, if I have the budget, instead of the budget being fixed up front, if the budget sort of keeps changing over time. So if you have like an inventory control version of the problem, um, there's a really easy way to see that you can't get constant regret. Roughly speaking, if you, if you tell me you're getting constant regret on an inventory control problem, I'll take the same problem and repeat it again. So just now you must get half the regret and now you sort of basically get an impossibility. So. So sort of a purely geometric reason why constant regret is not possible. Um, so that means we want to get, and I think you can stretch this to saying you have to get linear, but then it's tricky because like we are in the domain of like, there are good competitive algorithms. So like, how do we get a benchmark which is interesting for something like an inventory problem um, where despite knowing that if we push it too far, we are going to get linear regret. So, so there is some work on this now. So there's, there's a really nice paper by Alberto, um, by Alessandro, Alberto, Itai Gurvic, and I think a student of Alessandro's where they were looking at these kind of reusable resource problems and saying that, well, the way you want to think about the benchmark is in terms of, well, firstly, yeah, you want to look at instances where the problem doesn't regenerate fast enough. So you want the time that people stay like hold on to the resource to be somewhat large compared to the arrival rate. Um, and once you think about that instance, there is actually a fairly natural benchmark that you can do. But maybe, maybe the one comment I will make is uh, this really won't make much sense directly, but the, the simplest way I've been thinking about these problems is I want to know this probability that I will take the same action as the hindsight, the benchmark that I use. So, or rather, yeah, the probability that I don't take the same action. So in some sense, I, I want the benchmark to be easy to learn. And I also want the benchmark not to change too much. If it sort of settles down after some time, then it's easier for me to like latch onto it and then take the same action. So, so this is related to this notion of stability in online learning. So you somehow want your benchmarks to be stable, but also easy to learn given the data. But this is, I mean, it's somewhat vegan. I, I don't I have a better. I idea. was wondering if it, if you're if it came out of some property of like monotonicity of your values along sample paths or something like that. Um, um, like, and that's what this thought, budget not regenerating buys you or something. Some notion of like. Yeah, so sort of. So the again, the most general version I have of at least the constant regret results is this result with Daniel, where we said we sort of wanted to go down and just like look at like what were the invariances in the problem? Like what's the sub geometry of the state space that lets us get this? And 
the setting we understand well now is this, this notion of exchangeable action. So the action, the reward only depends on the the number of times you took a act, certain action in a certain state, but not the order of these actions. Um, inventory control or queuing or things like that, where you have like a regeneration cycle, the order actually matters. Um, so there's, sorry, in this class, we there is a certain hidden monotonicity. The, the state space is, I guess the state space is a lattice and it, it's always going downward in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. And now we are exploiting that monotonicity. Um, yeah, we don't know what the right monotonicity in other settings. I mean, that's a that's a great question. Um, that's I, I genuinely don't even know if it, if there's an easy way to see it or not. Like all of these have been surprisingly easy in hindsight, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to being surprised by what the right benchmark there is. Um, I, I have another question, but I, does anyone else have another question? <laughs> I have a question. Go for it. So Sid, can you tell me a little more about the performance difference lemma? Or can you give me a pointer as to how to use the compensated coupling to, to prove it? Yeah, sure. So the performance difference lemma, all it really says is if you have two policies, both of which are adapted to the natural filtration, so two non-anticipatory policies, how do I compare the two policies? And so this is why I was saying the, the compensated coupling doesn't care about the second, the benchmark being optimal. It's just some policy pi hat, and I have some policy pi. And now what I'm saying is, well, I'm trying to find the, the difference in the value function of pi hat and pi, but I'm going to run the process from the point of view of policy pi, but I'm going to measure the value function from the point of view of pi hat. So if I'm in a certain state, according to the policy pi, and I want to take a certain action according to the policy pi, I want to go to the policy pi hat and say, well, how much do I need to pay you to take this action? Mm -hmm. And the policy pi hat will say, well, this was my value function. This is what I was getting right now by taking the current action. You need to pay me the difference of that and the Q function. But that's just the definition of the Q function. Um, and this difference is what's called the advantage function. So if you've ever done any like, um, policy gradient methods. All it does is it defines this notion of the advantage function, but the advantage function, so really what I'm giving you is like, so you need to, so there's a random variable on the right where I'm adding up the advantage function under policy pi hat, um, but with respect to the sample path under policy pi. And that's it. That's all the performance difference lemma says. So it's, it's just, it's sort of directly applying compensated coupling with um, GT equal to FT. So everyone is in the natural filtration and just the benchmark is any policy, the status quo policy. Um, so this, for example, could be negative. The advantage function could actually be negative. You're doing that. That's typically what you want. Um, is there an inequality in the first line? No, so in this case, it's actually an equality. So it's an inequality because I always wrote it as an inequality, but I, I mean, you never really care about the equality, right? Like, you only care about the difference between it's actually equality. Um, okay, yeah. So then this is equality. Yeah, yeah. This um in this case it is equality. Actually, in all the cases before it was equality. Um there, there the inequality only comes when you sort of bound the thing on the right. Like in general, if you well, okay, the inequality came because I defined this quantity delta t as uh actually it's yeah, in the examples I've given you, it's always an equality you can just run the compensated coupling with an equality. But I, I was defining delta t here via like a, a stochastic dominance relation. But if you wrote it as a sort of almost sure equality, then you would just keep getting almost sure equality. Okay. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, let's um, thank Sid again. And um, we, why don't we stop the recording now? And then, um, you know, people can feel free to stay and chat if you like. Yeah. Sid, I was wondering, um, for the, uh, like, the example you, you showed, um,